this is your life, and I honestly didn't think I'd be saying those four words this evening, because last night, the million-to-one chance happened at last. This lady, whom we flew over especially from Australia, as our big surprise, bumped in in crowded Oxford Street to the very man we're expecting here at the moment. But thanks to her quick thinking, we're still in business. I'll explain that later, because he's arriving now at this building site, the building site, because he's made something of a, uh, all a speciality of making gags about building sites. But that isn't, in fact, his car. So we'll get out of sight and see what happens after that. Come on, Evelyn, this way. Oh, Jimmy, now you know why your sister-in-law, oh, so Evelyn, was in so Oxford Street last night. And we still have enough surprises left to say, tonight, Jimmy Cricket, this is your life. Thank you, Evelyn. <laughs> and I tell you, it was real quick thinking on this Hello, young lady's Evelyn. part yeah. to say she was here on a private visit and then disappear in the crowd, say she'd tell you all about it later. But now I tell you, the whole irony of this, Jimmy, is that you're the only person on your own show who knows that this girl is in London. So you've got a secret to keep, and for a special reason that'll become clear later, all right? Right, Evan. Yeah. So now you disappear, we'll see you later, and we'll take you back to the studio. Thank you, Loads Evan. of surprises, all Thank right? You. Okay, here we go. at that building site, I was hoping to have some flying crickets, but they were late. But wait for it. I've got news, they were hot on our heels, and here they come, I think, your first surprise, the driver delivering our flying crickets. <laughs> oh, great comedy pals of yours. <laughs> and here they come. Jim Bowen. <laughs> Nicholas Smith. <laughs> Nick Miller. <laughs> Rumbleweed, Albert and Carl Sutcliffe. Jimmy, I don't know how you rated those uh, surprise impersonations, but let's take a look at the character that inspired them. And there's more, there's more. I bumped into this fella, and he was carrying one of them big grandfather clocks. He said, why don't you look where you're going? I said, and why don't you wear a wristwatch like everybody else? <laughs> and I went to the grocers. I said, grocer, grocer. I'd like a chicken. He said, pull it. <laughs> I said, no, I'll carry it on to my arm. <laughs> I was passing your granddad's grave and the headstone was a little bit tilted. I got a piece of wire and tied one end of the headstone 
and the other end to a tree. Since then, your granny's been, and she thinks he's had the telephone put in. <laughs> Well, Jimmy Pricker, this is your life. And one of your first jobs as an entertainer was at a holiday camp at Morecambe Sands, keeping the kids happy as Uncle Jimmy. Now, one day you're sitting at a restaurant table at the camp with some pals when the waitress comes over, puts a pot of tea in front of you. You're Uncle Jimmy, aren't you? Well, today you can play mother and pour the tea. From those first words, Jimmy, romance blossomed, and two years later, you marry that same waitress, of course. Your wife, May. <laughs> Well, May, these days it's your turn to be the mother. Oh, very much so, Amy. Yes, we have four children, but they never tire of hearing stories when their dad was a kiddie's uncle to hundreds of children. And uh, there's a little story, too, about that, that uh, when we were courting, he, he wanted to learn tap dancing, so he only had one pair of shoes, you see, so he put taps underneath these. And when we used to rendezvous at night, I used to hear them before a song. <laughs> and I tell you, they especially, Jimmy, enjoy hearing the one about you as Long John Silver being made to walk the plank by the holiday children. And this is how your own children imagine they might have dealt with you themselves. Here they are, Dale, age 12, Frank, 10, Jamie, 8, and two-year-old Katie. Hello, Dad. We found another Long John Silver. And it's going to be hard luck on him. No, no, have mercy. There's sharks out there. Oh, no, no. Uh, say something. Mercy! Mercy! Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that pirate crew are, of course, right here. Dale, Frank, and Jamie. <laughs> And don't worry, you'll be seeing Katie later. But tell me, whatever happened to Long John Silver? <coughs> oh, Jim, my hearty. Never again. <laughs> Did you recognize him? Great sport, an old pal, former holiday camp manager where you worked, comedian Bill Martin. Ah, Bill. <laughs> Well, Jimmy Cricket, this is your life and you were born October 17th, 1945, youngest of five children of the late Frank and Philomena Mulgrew in Cookstown, County Tyrone. And in the Irish country town, your late father was quite a, a versatile businessman with his large family ready to help on anything. And there was plenty to do. Dad ran the local bar and the undertakers, in that order. From Belfast, eldest of the family, your brother John with his wife Frances and their children, Brendan and Peter. From their Scottish home near Glasgow, your brother Brian with his wife Gabrielle and children, Brian Jr. and Angela. Your brother Kieran with his wife Mary and their son Paul. And of course, your sister Mary. Well, John, it sounds like your father was quite a character, huh? Well, he certainly was, even, yeah. He uh, bought a Rolls Royce one time and said to turn it into a hearse. <laughs> <laughs> it took over six years. And all the kids in the district used to say everybody was dying to get into it. <laughs> when you... I hope they understood that. <laughs> well done, John. When you were still a youngster, Jimmy, they are aged eight, trying to force a smile for the camera, the family moved to Belfast, where your parents ran a grocery store. School was St. Patrick's in the Antrim Road, but Mary, Jimmy was more keen on entertaining than... Uh, Homework. He certainly was, Eamon. He always loved music and he was a great mimic and he taught himself to juggle. Now, Jimmy, <laughs> your enthusiasm for entertaining 
was always encouraged at the home of great family friends. And you made frequent visits to their house in Anderson's town, Belfast, where music and song was very much a part of everyday life. Of course, Jimmy, a familiar happy sight for you. The front room of the Core family. There's Mrs. Core still bashing away at the old piano <laughs> at the remarkable age of 84. And daughters Geraldine and Frances still belting out the songs you love. find plenty of encouragement in our house for your ambition to be an entertainer and so to this day you always said I was an inspiration to you. I'm very proud of that Jimmy. We always knew you'd make it didn't we girls? Yes. You still call on us don't you Jimmy anytime you're in Belfast? <laughs> and your favorite number is hands knees and bumps a daisy. Hands, knees, and bumps, a daisy, I love Well, Jimmy, Mrs. Corr at 84 wasn't up to making the journey, but her daughters are right here, Geraldine and Frances, with their brother Ed. <laughs> Ed, when Jimmy was uh, 16, he decided to enter a talent contest at the Plaza Ballroom, oh, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> night after night, he was round in our house impersonating P.J. Proby singing Hold Me. To you. And Francis, this is where you being a hairdresser came in handy for Jimmy, yeah? Yes. yes. Stand I up, had Jimmy, a... you're in trouble. Hairpiece. <laughs> <laughs> That's the like hairpiece to P.J. Proby. <laughs> and, uh... And we had to get your Philly shirt to complete the outfit. Yeah, now this is a dare, Jimmy. They dare me to do it. We've got the music. Remember? Can you remember? I'll have a go, Emma. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> music. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving school age 16 in 1961, you dream of one day becoming a full-time entertainer. But meanwhile, you have to make a living. But work or no work, you meet up every weekend at that grandly named fish and chip shop, the Palm Grove Cafe, with your five closest friends. And every weekend, it seemed as though you'd got yourself a different job. Boyhood pals from 27 years ago in Belfast. Fergus Woods, <laughs> Brendan O'Gorman, Ed Smith, <laughs> Liam McCann, and Danny O'Hagan. <laughs> so Fergus, what sort of jobs, what sort of jobs did he have? Well, at one time, him and he was a cinema projectionist, but with a difference. Uh, at the interval, mm -hmm. the manager used to allow him to come down onto the stage and he used to mime two records. <laughs> and then he went to work for a box office firm in, in Dormer Road, making boxes, paper boxes. And then, well, he also delivered groceries, Eamon, but uh, you kept falling off the bike, Jim, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> he, also, he also marked up for the biggies, marked up uh, as board marker, biggies. Ah, but there's more, Jimmy. Yes, <laughs> yes, there is more, Eamon. Then he delivered fish. <laughs> Delivered fish, yes, but the longest job of all was at that betting shop at McAlevey's in Wine Tavern Street, Belfast. Doing this job, and the man who employed you, managing director Peter Nichol. Hello, Jimmy. This was your job, marking up the runners on a Saturday night and marking up the football results. But it was after work that you showed us what a winner you were likely to be in the entertainment business. Remember this? A dance that was a big hit here in the mid-60s called the Hucklebuck, and you used to demonstrate it to us every day after work. That's why we call you the Hucklebuck Kid, and what's more, we haven't forgotten how to do it. Remember the general manager, John McAllister? 
also Leo Morrison, and there's more, shop manager John Bradley. And it even caught on with the punters, thanks to you, Jimmy, the Hucklebuck kid. See you, kid. And for the Hucklebuck kid, he's right here, Peter Nichol. Bob Todd, do you reckon you could do the Hucklebuck? Uh, uh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I do it every night coming back from the pub. <laughs> a good recovery, too. <laughs> Jimmy, like so many young hopers before you, you become a Butlin's red coat. And 1968 sees you at Clacton, where you become great pals with another red coat. And night after night, after work, you plot and scheme to find a world-shattering act of your own. Guess what we came up with? A brand new idea. We became Cohen and Kelly. <laughs> he was Cohen, you were the Kelly, that same pal from nearly 20 years ago. Charles Elliott. <laughs> Oh, yes, stand beside him. Stand beside him because, Charles, I wonder, and so do you, if Jimmy remembers a little routine he did together. The start of one marvellous routine. I hope you do remember it, Jimmy. Yes. <laughs> Don't say anything about my nose because it, it's a Roman nose. It roams all over your face. Well done! <laughs> Thank you, Charles. <laughs> well, he was right. You bet you would remember it. <laughs> As it turned out, Jimmy, Flanagan and Alan could sleep soundly in their beds because Cohen and Kelly didn't exactly take off. So 1972 sees you this time, not a red coat, but a blue coat at Ponton's holiday camp at Morecambe Sands where you met May. But May, you weren't the only waitress there. <laughs> no, no, no way I'm gonna do. I, w I used to sing with my sister. And uh, I thought in actual fact, I saw myself as a sort of a, a well-dressed, uh, budding Madonna. You did, and, uh, and uh, you had this act, as you say, in a duet called The Tweedy Sisters. Your real life sister with. That's right. There you go, and baby, here in my well. You left me here so I could sit and cry. Well. Sounds great, Why doesn't it? Of course, the other Tweedy sister, your sister in law, Margaret. <laughs> Well, now, out of work in the winter, you and May, of course, Margaret, decide to work together with Jimmy, he doing his act and you doing yours. Yes, that's right, uh, Eamon. We used to go around uh, all the clubs, remember, Jimmy, in that old banger of a van that you bought for five pounds, remember? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds a bargain as well, but it sounds a long way from the big time. It was, really, but Jimmy's been very determined to get on, really, and uh, nothing's put him off, has it? <laughs> I mean, even they, they and me won one time, do you remember, the talent contest in Stockport, and you didn't come in, do you remember? Yeah. Anyway, no, no, I didn't. But we were very good, too. We, we were. We treated him, didn't we, to some fish and chips, didn't we? We were winnings. Yes, yes, we were yeah. very good, really. <laughs> you didn't hold it against us, did you, Jimmy? No, I, I was very happy for the fish and chips, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you two were the ones who won, and he got nowhere. Great. <laughs> Well, anyway, slowly, Jimmy, you start to build your name and reputation as a comic in the clubs in the North. And in 1974, feeling a bit more secure, you and May are married at St. Joseph's Catholic Church, Barry. Then, seven years ago, comes your big chance. You reach the finals of LWT's Search for a Star. Hey, Chairman. Come here. <laughs> I've just come from the building site. Yeah, I went for a job today. He said, where do you come from? I said, Ireland. He said, have you lived there all your life? I said, not yet. <laughs> yeah. And there's more. He said, what's your date of birth? I said, the 17th of October. He said, what year? I said, every year. Well, the search was over because you won, and since then you've become great friends of stars, not only in show business, but in, for instance, snooker. And if you look at that screen, 
A time to cue former world champion Dennis Taylor. Hello, Raymond. Uh, how are you, Jimmy? I see that the big man is caught up with you at last. It's a bit of a shock when it happens, isn't it? But uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy every minute of it. I'm just thinking back, Jimmy, to the first time, uh, the first time we met you invited me onto your show. And you arrived at our house in this beautiful suit. You looked like a, a real businessman. And you had your briefcase with you. And uh, proceeded to open the briefcase. Uh, I thought you were going to pull out a load of papers. Took out a pair of bedroom slippers. <laughs> put your bedroom slippers on and made yourself at home. Uh, you're always welcome, Jimmy, in our house. Uh, it's not only Patricia and myself that are great fans of yours. There's more. There is his own son, Brendan. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> I'm a glamour in the mob one. And I come find the M6. So I went up the M3 twice. <laughs> Thank you, Brendan and Dennis Taylor. <laughs> Jimmy, one of the reasons you're so popular with your fellow artists is that you're always prepared to give up your time for charity concerts and one venue is particularly memorable. Jim, I've got a woman out here from the Fairfield Hall Croydon who wants to see the end of your act. <laughs> and to explain that, your old pal, that marvellous comedian, of course, Roy Hunt. <laughs> Well, you're better than it's in on the secret. Yeah, I, I've got to tell you, because now Jim's great with charity shows, you know. All performers in show business do a lot of charity work, but he does a lot of cha well, charity work for our charity, Entertainment Silas Benevolent Fund. And we did a, a concert last year at Croydon, the Fairfield Hall Croydon, and I introduced him, you know, and he walked on. And he walked on, he hadn't even opened his mouth. And there's a woman on the front row, stood up, looked at him, and walked out the building. <laughs> We don't know who she was or what was to blame at all. You know, I think she must have been a welly manufacturer's widow. <laughs> he's a very special bloke to us, uh, Eamon, in our charity, because he's one of those blokes who never says no, you know. He, he'll go anywhere, all over the country and this sort of thing. And it drives me mad, you know. I'm embarrassed to ask him because he always says yes. But he's a bit special. I think he's a very special bloke because it's an awfully old-fashioned word to use these days, but he's a real Christian old Jim, you know, and that's absolutely true. As far as I know, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't swear, and he doesn't drink. And, I mean, you'd soon know if he was drunk, wouldn't you? He'd put the wellies on the right foot, wouldn't you, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> Jim. Thank you, Roy Hodgson. <laughs> Just one more thing, Jimmy, before we finish. That battered van that you bought for a fiver, which you heard about back in those early days with May and Margaret, had a roadie and a driver. Right, May? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed, Evan. Yes, we had a third sister, and she was the only one that could drive, you see, this old, very battered van. So uh, we roped her into being our roadie, and she wanted to be here tonight, but unfortunately a member of her family was ill. So instead, um, I believe you have a phone call coming we all the way from Perth, Western Australia. Perth, Western <laughs> Australia. And seeing Evelyn, of course, I know, and you know, Jimmy, would have meant uh, been as heartwarming for May as for you. Well, she thought the word of Evelyn, and that's why, by this amazing coincidence, that it's a present for you, that she's not in Perth, she's here tonight for the both of us. Oh. Yes, she's right here. That third Tweedy sister, Evelyn, and nobody knows her. Jimmy Cricket, it's almost a life within a life. This is your life. Thank you, Amy. <laughs>